and I want to share a really great strategy with you um, around personal connection. But uh, let me start with a story. When um, I was doing this workshop in South Carolina, and at the first break, the morning break, one of the teachers came up to me and she told me this story. She said she had this girl in one of her classes that was the bane of her existence. This girl was mean and catty and inappropriate, never came to class on time, and she just could not stand her. But she noticed that the girl was always drinking bottled water in class, and so off the, for no particular reason at all, close to the end of the first semester, she says to this girl one minute before the bell rings, hey, I noticed that you're always drinking bottled water in class. Have you ever tried the flavored bubbly Calistoga waters? And the girl looks at her and says, are you talking to me? And the teacher says, yeah, I, I noticed you're always drinking bottled water. Have you ever tried the flavored bubbly Calistoga? The girl says, I don't know nothing about whatever bubbly water. And the teacher says, okay, well, I think you would like it. I have some at my house. I'll bring you one tomorrow and you can try it. The girl says, whatever, and walks away. The next day, the girl comes to class late, because this girl always comes late. She's inappropriate all period long. At the end of the period, the teacher calls her up and says, presents her with this bottle of Calistoga water. And the girl looks at it, and she says, what is this? And the teacher says, remember yesterday we were talking, and I said I would bring you one from my house. This is the one that I brought you. And the girl says, did you bring one for everybody in the class? And the teacher says, um, no, because remember yesterday when we were talking? So the girl is super skeptical, but she takes the bottle of water. She says, okay, and she leaves. The next day, she comes into class on time for the first time the entire school year. She is appropriate. She raises her hand and participates. She even goes so far as to admonish another student who is misbehaving in class that day. <laughs> And then at the end of the period, she goes up to the teacher. She says, so um, I, I really like that, that bottle of water, other flavors, other kind of, what other kinds of things do you have at your house? And um, <laughs> this whole personal conversation ensues. And after that, the teacher tell, told me, this girl became one of her favorite students and did really well in the class. And at the end of the story, she says to me, if I had known that all it was going to take was a bottle of water. I would have given it to her on the first day of school. But it wasn't the bottle of water, right? It was that the teacher took a, a personal interest in something related specifically and only to that kid, and for whatever reason, it completely transformed the way the kid related to the class and the teacher. Sometimes it is that easy. And sometimes it is not. So... <laughs> For those times when it is not, I'm going to share one last strategy with you and then we'll break for lunch. But for, first, before I share the strategy, in your mind you need to think of the student from last year who drove you the most crazy. Okay, everybody's got two or six kids in mind? Yeah? You know you're thinking about the right kid. This is the kid who, when absent, everybody else does better. But they are never absent, that kid. Okay. So with this kid, here's a strategy that you can try to create that personal connection. It's called the 2 by 10 strategy. It's a little bit different than the 2 by 4 strategy. <laughs> Somebody got it. Softer. This is on page what in the handout? Page six, thank you. 2 by 10, and this is how it works. With that kid who drives you the most crazy, who's the most challenging for you, Two minutes a day, ten days in a row, have a personal conversation with this kid on anything that they are interested in, as long as the conversation remains G-rated. Now, how do you know what they're interested in? Well, what are they listening to? What are they wearing? What are they talking to their friends about? What are they carving into your desks? Anything that you can start a personal conversation about. The man who did the research on this, his name is Raymond Vladkowski, and I cited him on the slide. His research indicates that there will be up to an 85% improvement in behavior for just this one kid, if you use the 2 by 10. And the rest of the class will improve also, because when this kid does better, everybody does better. They're that much of a disruption when they're there. So what's happening, in my eyes, is kids who are the most challenging for us have a constantly cramping muscle, represented by my hand. And that muscle is cramping because they want, but they don't have, a close personal relationship with an adult authority figure. And for most kids, this need is paramount to learning content. 
So when they act out, it's their way of saying this need has not yet been met. When it is met, they're able to relax, that muscle is able to relax, and they're able to focus more in class. So let me give you an example of how not to use the 2x10. And I do need a volunteer. My volunteer will be Latasha. Latasha, thank you for volunteering. So Latasha um, is my student. I'm trying the 2x10. This would be the incorrect way to use it with Latasha. Well, good morning, Latasha. It is 10.43 AM, time for our two-minute personal conversation. <laughs> It can't be obvious what you're doing, right? And if all of my conversations with Latasha up until this point in the year have been disciplinary in nature, she might be a little skeptical as to why I want to have a personal conversation with her. So you have to be persistent and you have to keep at it. But let's say I get a conversation going. Let's say Latasha and I are talking about <sighs> ultimate fighting, because Latasha is really into <laughs> ultimate fighting. <laughs> So we're talking about this for five days or so, and then on the fifth day, though, Latasha changes the topic of conversation to basket weaving. Well, then I am right there, because she is the engine and I am the caboose. She decides where the conversation goes, and I am just following and supporting. Now, I don't know anything about basket weaving, but I got Google, right? I can find something out about basket weaving that I can bring to that conversation and keep that conversation going. So then if after 10 days, Latasha comes up to me and says, Mrs. Dearborn, can we talk about basket weaving some more? No, I'm sorry, Latasha, your 10 days are up. <laughs> of course, you would never say that to a student, but what the point I'm trying to illustrate is that the 2 by 10 is for establishing the initial connection, which is the toughest part. Once it's been established, you can be more flexible about the how, the when, and the where of the ongoing conversation. Two by ten. You were standing up in small groups talking about positive connections. If in your small group at least one person came up with an idea around giving kids choices, if that idea came up giving kids choices, please raise your hand. Look around the room. Not bad, about six or eight kids, people, that's great. Okay. Now, it's not that this happens all the time. Normally in a group of 100 teachers, I get one or two. So, And it's not that teachers don't think we should give kids choices, it's that we don't always associate choices with positive connections. But when kids make choices about their learning or their learning environment, they're much more positively connected to it, and it's much more motivating, and acting out goes down. Let me give you a couple of uh, suggestions or ideas. Um, well, first, a framework. My suggestion is ask yourself, just as you finish designing your lesson, before you put it away, ask yourself one last question. Where can I build in choices for my students in this lesson? Where can I build in choices for my students in this lesson? Just ask yourself that question every time. Where can I build in choices? Now, oftentimes, the answer is going to be nowhere. <laughs> Sorry, kids, no choices today, right? But by asking the question consistently, you'll find little things leading to bigger things. Example, kids, we're doing three things today. Which would you like to do first? If it's not wired in sequence, you can ask that question. The kids can vote, or a student whose birthday it is can make the decision. Or you might ask, you might say, uh, kids, we got uh, 20 possible homework questions tonight. Go home tonight. Pick out any seven, bring them back tomorrow, complete. I guarantee you every kid in the class will look at all 20 trying to find the seven easiest. Okay? <laughs> and then you can, uh, here's another one. Give the kids a quiz with 12 questions. They choose any 10. Kids go, a choice on a quiz? My teacher is a god. <laughs> it just changes something. Now, little things will lead to bigger things as we stay with that question, like alternatives to assignments or kids teaching each other project-based learning, community service. All these things bubble to the surface as we consistently look for giving kids tailored choices. Make sure you tailor the options. Not just anything you want, but specific things that you can live with and celebrate them choosing that. So choices really is valuable as well. Think about your best friend or your best friends. And if you described that person... I bet you a lot of you would say one characteristic of that person is that they listen. Now, listening is tricky. If you've got 180 kids a day, how do you listen to them all, right? But there's ways to do that that are efficient. For example, I'll give you an example of this. Um, I used to, when I taught the at-risk high school kids in social studies, uh, I had a policy that often on Fridays we'd play, we'd play an educational game, which the kids loved. 
And then the policy went, if on a particular Friday we don't play a game, then everyone in the class is allowed to complain out loud for up to three seconds in a G-rated manner. <laughs> and I said, more than three seconds of complaining is hard work, and we don't want to work hard on Fridays. Okay, so a Friday would arrive, and I'd say, okay, class, guess what? We're not playing a game today. Ready? One, two, three. And I'd go like this, and they'd all moan and complain. And I'd look at my watch, and I'd go, one, two, and I'd go like this, and they'd stop. What was so amazing was for the rest of the class period, they were totally with me. If I didn't give them three seconds to complain, they complained the entire class period. They needed three seconds of public recognition of their feelings. I had the rest of the class for content. And so it doesn't always have to be the long version, which is wonderful to really listen to a student for a long period of time, but there's just that sense that, that the kid, they, they matter to you. A teacher in San Francisco did this every year. Kids walk in the classroom on the first day of school, and he writes on the board, students, I am available to be invited to have dinner with you and your parents at your homes on Wednesday evenings. Please let me know. This guy had a free meal once a week for the entire school year. I don't know if he had a life, but he had a free meal once a week for the entire school year. Do you think his classroom management benefited from this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Turns to the kid, I know where you live. (laughs) One more thing about positive connections. Our goal is to find balance. Think of a seesaw or a balance scale or a teeter-totter. And one side is how personally we connect with the kids, and the other side is how willing we are to hold our ground with them. Now, when I first started teaching, I wasn't so developed over here, so I thought, okay, I'll just be really personal with the kids. And, of course, what happened was we got along great until I asked them to do something that I wanted them to do and they didn't want to do, and they would fight me like crazy. Now, the other, that same year, across the hall from me, there was a teacher. She was at least 500 years old, and she talked like this to the kids. And I thought she was mean, but she was actually just firm because kids would flock to her classroom to hang out at lunch. So she was extreme on one side in terms of her willingness to hold her ground and extreme on the other in terms of personal connections and had that balance, which is really the goal when we make positive connections with kids.